the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, and I am very pleased today to welcome back to the show for the first time in a long time, Danny Burton. Danny, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, it's been a long time since I've had you on the show, and you wrote a book on Anthony Woodville, and I thought, this is such a great topic. Who doesn't love to hear about the Woodvilles? And I just, I had to have you back on to discuss him. So before we get into questions and learning more about him, my first question is always, what made you choose Anthony Woodville for a topic of a book? Uh, well, it all started about nine years ago, which is kind of where the research journey started. Um, I knew of him through um, his connection with how Richard III became Richard III. That's kind of what I knew of him before. Um, so we visited Pontefract Castle as a family just just around about the time I was starting uni, and that's where Anthony was executed. So you know, I just went there. You know, you know, it's got obviously quite a historical place, quite a few connections with the Wars of the Roses. I uh, went there, didn't, you know, see anything to do with that part of its history. They're very much more focused on that's where Richard II died, which is obviously another fairly important thing that happened. Yes. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I kind of was like, well, why isn't there anything? Because it's quite an important castle, particularly in Wars of the Roses, but obviously in terms of Antony's story... So I remember asking the staff that worked there, you know, do you know anything about what he was like when he was here, his execution, anything, you know, just anything would be good. Um, and they just looked at me quite blankly and went, we don't really know who you're talking about, <laughs> which I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> um, and that's kind of what started this research journey, really, because I was like, well, why don't they know who Anthony is? So um, it was through that that I kind of realised that actually, even though you kind of know the Woodville name, that Anthony's kind of been a bit forgotten and it was trying to bring him out the shadows, really. Yeah. And honestly, the only thing I ever knew about him before your book was the the movie The White Queen, which was based on Philippa Gregory's book. Have you read the book or seen the the series? Yes, definitely. Yes. So I was... Obviously, being a big Wars of the Roses fan in general, I was very excited when they they did the White Queen, and I think that was one of the other things that kind of set the ball rolling. Of um, again, that even in that, he's kind of a background figure, but obviously important. Obviously, particularly to Elizabeth Woodville's story, obviously is is, is her brother. And I was like, surely this man can't be this grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and actually, you know, I found found somebody very different to that portrayal. Yes, okay, he did have a very serious side to him, but I don't think, just like we're all complicated, I don't think that was the whole of him. Right, there was more to him than we, than was portrayed on film or in the book, most definitely. Well, let's start at the beginning, really, when it comes to Anthony Woodville, and let's talk about his family his lineage, where he came from, so that people could fully understand. We know about Elizabeth Woodville, but let's talk about Anthony's lineage today. Okay, so the place to start really is obviously with both Elizabeth and Anthony's parents, Jaquetta and, and Richard Woodville. So everybody's got this idea of the fact that because of what happens when Elizabeth marries Edward IV, it's all, you know, very much okay, this is a fairly scheming family they want to promote themselves and okay I'm not saying that's entirely inaccurate because um there are definitely some examples of that within the Woodville family but in terms of Richard and Duquette that's not how it starts really their love their marriage is a is a love match entirely basically and um, so Jaquetta was first of all married to John Duke of Bedford who was the uncle of Henry VI and regent of France and he didn't last long into their marriage basically and we know that this kind of around about the time that we're not sure about the entire circumstances but when Richard and Jaquetta kind of know each other as Richard is actually a knight within Bedford's household so they've at least known each other um, before that, but obviously as to when a love match started is is a 
uh, you know, been lost the ether as it were, but, um, you know, they'd have known each other and, you know, they paid the price for that match themselves because obviously uh, Richard is only a, a, a very lowly knight and Jaquetta comes from a very well-to-do noble family who can trace their lineage to French royalty, you know, so we can see immediately that actually their, their relationship is very similar to what their daughter then goes on to have um, in that respect. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so when we're looking at Anthony's life, I think one of the things that intrigued me about your book was his involvement with Edward the Fourth. And when exactly that came into the picture, because of course, I'm going to use the White Queen as a reference again, because that's what I know the best. In the White Queen, of course, he didn't really like have any interaction with Edward the Fourth until Edward showed up at the castle. You know, then he was like, oh, this guy, you know, <laughs> but that really wasn't the case, was it? No, so when the Wars of the Roses first start out, because of obviously that connection that they that the um that the Wardvilles have had with Bedford and obviously the Lancastrian side, that is where they start off with the Wars of the Roses. They are firmly in the Lancastrian camp, definitely. Until you end up getting to the big massive Battle of Towton, which is basically the battle that cemented Edward the Fourth as Edward the Fourth. Mm. It's that that has helped his you know, his claim to the the throne basically and it because it it's this massive Yorkist victory so both Richard and Anthony are there fighting at Towton for the Lancastrians Anthony himself is um misreported as having been killed in the battle which is understandable considering it is probably one of the biggest battles that's ever happened <laughs> um you know on British soil so um I can understand easily why you know that kind of thing would happen but the Woodvilles are canny in a way. They they kind of, you know, seen this massive Lancashian defeat and they go, look, Edward's quite clearly proved himself right now. I think perhaps we ought to go and grovel a little bit. And that's exactly what they do. They ask they ask for pardons and then within months uh, they get it. And that's kind of um sort of where their story kind of starts, really. Um, but, you know, it doesn't obviously develop into the familial relationship for, for quite a year, few years after that. Yeah, it's so interesting when when you find out that that's the truth behind the story, because I feel like, you know, historical fiction sometimes tells us the wrong narrative, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, I mean, I'm all for a good, um, you know, historical fiction, but it's always a case of remembering that it's somebody's viewpoint mixed in with a bit of fact right it's a story it's it's being written yeah. to entertain it's not necessarily being written as factual yeah definitely okay so let's talk a little bit let's move forward a little bit to i guess i don't know did he have his first marriage prior to elizabeth marrying edward edward the fourth let's talk about that yes yeah so the other thing that's usually kind of thrown at the Woodvilles is very much how much that after Edward and Elizabeth marry, how much of the marriage market that they take up because there's a lot of Woodville siblings. Yes. Um, but actually, yeah, Anthony is one of the only ones that that doesn't actually apply to. So mm -hmm. he did actually marriage, marry his first wife, Elizabeth Scales, prior to Elizabeth and Edward getting married. We don't really have an exact date for their marriage, but it could be anywhere from around about Towton to, you know, at, to any point within the next couple of years before Elizabeth marries Edward. Um, so, like I said, you're talking quite a few years at least um, okay. before that, that, that the royal marriage per se. Um, and the whole reason that marriage is the fact that the Woodvilles and the Scales, they have a kind of friendship going on. So Richard Woodville is a brother-in-arms, comrade, friend with Elizabeth Scales' father, Thomas Lord Scales. So again, it's like, that's probably another reason for that match, that obviously um, Elizabeth Scales is her father's heiress, so obviously that's a bit, a bit of playing in there as well. But it's also creating that closer ties of kinship between the two families as well. Yeah. So what kind of marriage did Anthony have with her? So this is this is actually quite a hard question because mm. we don't really know that much in terms of specifics about their about their marriage per se. But 
the bits that we do get is mostly from kind of legal documents, that sort of thing. So we do know that obviously they, so he, Anthony inherits the title of Lord Scales through his wife. So that's why you, think you see him either listed as Lord Scales or El Rovers or both at the same time. So he, so in that respect, you kind of think, oh yeah, okay, definitely he's married her for the money, the title, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but actually, where the thing that's most one of the things that most surprised me during this research was um, so Anthony was also Lord of the Isle of Wight, so he looked after the Isle of Wight. And well, there was one document that turned up in the Isle of Wight archives, and it said Anthony and his consort Elizabeth, meaning his wife Elizabeth. So I think, wow, that's that. I think you know, we didn't, like I said, we really don't know that much about their marriage, other than we can glean the fact they seem to quite like um, enjoying each other's company. They had um, so in their lands uh, in Norfolk, we have Kings Lynn off giving them fish, both of them, you know, in both of their names, not just Antony's. So I think actually the fact that this legal document, which is kind of given. Uh, the Isle of Wight tax relief, that that sort of idea, specifically mentions Anthony and his consort. I think that's quite unusual wording, and I think in a way, will show what kind of relationship that they that they must have had. But they they'd have also spent a lot of time apart as well, because Anthony was away doing a lot of a lot of things. Um, but we also know that they took uh, Margaret of York, Edward's youngest sister to her marriage to Charles, the future Duke of Burgundy. They both went out as part of, their mar- of her marriage party. So it's, they, they were kind of headed up that, that party. So and like I said, you kind of get gl- glimpses of probably what their, their relationship was like. Yeah, I wish we had portraits of them. Like, you know, when we look at the Tudor period, it seems like there's portraits of everyone. But during the reign of Edward IV and before that, there's really not these visual images to make us more attached to these figures. Yes. Yeah. Because I think obviously that's not something that's come about just yet. Um, But yes, sadly we only have one image of of Anthony Woodville and that's from an illuminated manuscript um, that he actually helped produce um, with, with Caxton. So that's again, like you said, it's a very stock image. So you kind of get a flavor of who he is, but not quite enough for, (laughs) <laughs> what, what you want either so yeah <laughs> <laughs> now in that marriage did the couple have any children together no so Anthony only ever had one illegitimate daughter that we think that he had before his marriage to Elizabeth because um she was actually named Margaret so we think that she was probably named after Margaret of Anjou whilst the family was still Lancastrian and we don't really know much about her either other than her mother was probably a, a wealth woman so we don't know how that relationship came about either um and all we do know is that actually Anthony really provided for her and she married a man called Robert Poignance which actually for an illegitimate daughter was a good marriage so he did um make sure that she was looked after in that respect and that's really all we know about Margaret as well wow that's too bad well the marriage if I recall from your book and correct me if I'm wrong wasn't super long was it um yeah so elizabeth scales she died in in 1473 so this is when anthony's he's just about he's actually away in spain when elizabeth scales dies um so he's actually on a pilgrimage to santiago de compostela which is where um you know big big pilgrimage site in, in northern europe um, and he's actually just undertaken that in honour of his mother, Chiquetta, who died a year later. Mm. Um, so we don't have a clue whether or not he'd have known, you know, any news would have been able to reach him whilst he was on this pilgrimage or whether he had to actually come home to that news. But either way, you know, that's that's quite a, a double blow in that respect that, you know, within a few years that he's lost two, two of the closest women in his, his, to him. Yeah, that would be incredibly difficult. Um, I'm also curious. So within that time, then his sister would have married Edward the fourth and his sister would be queen consort. Do we have any idea of what kind of relationship Anthony had with Edward the fourth? Did they get along? Do we know? Yeah. So, um, Anthony's relationship with Edward the fourth 
they they were you know they were quite close really so they are you know Anthony is part of that inner circle of Edward the Fourth. People say very much how oh, the Woodville's completely and utterly benefited. And actually, I'm not saying that they didn't. You know, <laughs> that would be completely the wrong thing to say. But actually, Anthony didn't gain a lot of the titles and privileges until after 1473. So that's after Prince Edward, the Prince of Wales, is born. So it's kind of a bit more, he's been rewarded for looking after and helping um, the nephew, his nephew to grow up. So in that respect, he doesn't benefit straight away in terms of a lot of the, you know, the titles and, and privileges he's getting. But again, like I said, he's part of this, this inner circle and he can't avoid being now the king's, the king's brother-in-law. Um, but they are very different, very different people really so i think um because anthony was very much you know a jouster he was very much into his books he was definitely a very religious person um and as far as we can tell uh, he was also quite um reserved and you know like i said the exact opposite of what what edward the edward the fifth is <laughs> uh, edward the fourth is sorry so yes so it's it's like I said, there's not really too much source-wise about what their relationship is, but I think they got on, but they were quite very, very different people. But um, Anthony who was part of that inner circle who went into exile with Edward and obviously returned with him as well. So like I said, they are there together um, and he, Anthony's very much chosen often as the English jousting champion. So, you know, there's you know, they must have got some sort of good relationship going on, definitely. But like I said, completely different personality wise. Well, it's interesting to me because when I think of Edward the Fourth, I think um one of the things I remember were learning about him was he had a rather large library. So I feel like that's something that he and Anthony had in common was books. Would you agree? Yes. Definitely. They did, yeah, Edward did have a large library and that actually only really comes into existence as his own library after they come back from their exile in Burgundy. And that's probably because they're whilst in exile in Burgundy, so at this point, Charles the Bold cannot really openly acknowledge them as, as exiles because it's a little bit politically, you know, not the right thing to be doing. But again, you know, he is now, Edward, you know, by that point, he's over the false brother-in-law as well himself. So he needs to do it a bit more under the radar. So what happens is he gets one of his, because um, obviously Burgundy is lots of different states made up in into Burgundy. So he actually gets one of his representatives, Louis, the Lord of Grethuse, to be the person to look after them whilst they're in exile. And Grethuse is actually the person that's known to have got the largest library in Europe. So I think that's partly what's influencing Edward in terms of we know that this is part, that's one of the reasons why he's building up his library, because he's obviously been immersed in that. And Grethuse does actually gift books to him. So I think it's very much, as with Edward, with a lot of things to do with Edward, is he really doing it because he likes it or is he doing it because he thinks it's a little bit of a, you know, the latest trend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's like a, if you own a lot of books now just because it, you want it to make you look smart versus actually reading the books. Yes, I'm not <laughs> saying that he didn't do, but I think that um, knowing Edward's personality, he, he was busy doing other things, <laughs> when, uh, yeah. really. Um, whereas I think Anthony was very much... He really was immersing himself and he really was completely and utterly interested in literature. And like I said, he, he had the connection uh, being the first and best patron, English patron of William Caxton. And he's helping to produce all of these new texts in the in, you know, in, in English for the first time. Um, so I think, you know, he's gone above and beyond, whereas I kind of really do feel a little bit like it was like, yeah, that's that's my collection over there. <laughs> Take a look at it. It's over. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about and it's been a while since you've been on the show to talk about William Caxton, but let's talk about who William Caxton was 
and the bigger involvement maybe that Anthony had with him, big picture. Okay. So William Caxton was the first person to bring the printing press to England. And so, first of all, he starts off in, in actually, funnily enough, in Burgundy. And that's where we kind of think where the connection with Anthony came, either through the marriage of Margaret of York or whilst they're in exile. And he doesn't actually start out as a printer at all. He's actually, first of all, he's a merchant and he actually, that's kind of what he's doing. And he's actually ends up working his way up within the merchant English merchant community in Bruges. And he actually works his way up to being the representative of the whole English merchant community. So that kind of gives you a sense of where he, his background is a little bit. So we do know that obviously that means that he's probably taking part in a lot of the celebrations when Margaret comes to Burgundy. So that's one of the options of, you know, where that connection might have come from. Well, like I said, um, when the uh, Edward and his court are in exile, because by that point, Caxton is starting to try out printing. And actually, Margaret of York was his first proper patron uh, whilst he's setting up in, in Burgundy there. So that's kind of where that starts. And we think one or other of those options is how Anthony kind of sort of started to know uh, William Caxton and then Caxton set up his first printing shop and printing press in London in around about 1476 so and actually Anthony was his patron right from the very beginning and within a year they produced the Dixon Sayings of Philosophers and that is actually the first book to be published in England the definite date and place of publication. Well that's really cool that is really that's a great story and I and I always think of that painting. There is that famous painting, right, of um, Edward the Fourth and Elizabeth Woodville. I think it's you see their library in the background, and maybe there's a printing press in the room. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yes, yes, that's actually more of a yeah. That's kind of a bit more of a later version of what happened. Um, but yes, that's kind of usually sort the sort of image that people remember. Yeah. And of course, then it makes it seem like it was Edward the Fourth and Elizabeth Woodville who brought that all about, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, which obviously, you know, we've got to act, kind of acknowledge the king. And that's basically what happens, certainly with the Dixon Singers philosophers, is they do make, obviously, but even as this new technology is forming, there is a crossover still with illuminated manuscripts. So that known image that we have of Anthony from the Illuminated Manuscript is actually him presenting the copy of the Dixon Sayings of the Philosophers to Edward IV in the manuscript version. So, yes. So I think, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that shows you a bit more as to as to where that's, that's come from. Yeah, the truth comes out, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk too about, um, he didn't, he wasn't just married once. He had a second marriage. And let's talk about that and how that marriage came about and how long it was between his first marriage and his second marriage as well, and what that might say. Yeah, so you're talking about around about eight, nine years um, between both marriages. Um, so Anthony's second wife, Mary Fitzlewis, she was actually only a teenager, so there was quite a large age gap between them both. And again, we don't actually really quite understand Anthony's thinking behind this particular marriage because while she's not obviously, she's connected to quite a lot of the rich families at this time, she's not in direct inheritance of anything. Hmm. You know, if there is, it's kind of things way off and you can like argue forever over who might or might not. Um, get anything so that doesn't seem to be that doesn't seem to be a motivation and then again you think well if she is a teenager and a very young teenager at that is he thinking about okay I've not had any children with my first wife is that a possibility but even so she would not have been at the age to be having children just yet she's that young you know it's just before um the age that they kind of sort of agree that maybe trying for children is, is a good idea. So, like I so said, there's not really any clear-cut 
reason as to as to, to why they got married necessarily. Um, and we believe that they spent even less time than what Anthony and Andy's first wife, Elizabeth Scales, would have spent together. So it's all a bit hazy in terms of his, his second wife. Um, but we do know in... You know, that's quite a long time as well for somebody to uh, not be married, particularly in, in this period. So um, we do know that actually Edward IV did kind of try and push Anthony as, um, as a good, you know, Bachelor of England kind of idea. So we do know that he's trying to marry off to him, him off to people uh, in Burgundy. Princess of Scotland, uh, because he's he's trying to use Anthony as a replacement for Clarence when whilst they're arguing and whatever. Um, so again, it's proven a little bit that probably what Edward is thinking about Anthony, um, but is he using him as a bit of a political bargaining tool? A little bit, yes. Yeah, it's interest. That's interesting that he did that. One of the things that we know about Anthony Woodville is that he was very pious, right? Yes. Yeah. Can you tell us some more about that? Because I think that plays a lot into his character. Yeah. So as I've alluded to, we we know that he he went on pilgrimage quite a lot in his life, certainly um, within uh, the Brittle Circle in England. Like I said, he went to Santiago de Compostela, um, and that was also where he actually picked up the French text that became the Dixon saying of philosophers. So that's it's quite a few things going off. Again, for him, creating texts, certainly with the Dixon saying as philosophers, because that's actually moral and religious sayings by ancient philosophers. That's another way for him to get across his his religious uh, and moral moral ideas. So it's quite complicated actually, his you know, how he how he portrays his faith. He's not not only is he obviously going on these massive pilgrimages, um, and not just within this country, also abroad, because he also went to, to Rome later on as well. You know, that's that takes a lot of organizing, that takes a lot of this is what I want to do, this is how I want to, you know, share my faith to other people or even even to himself, obviously as well. So that really does play a part in in how he's thinking, how he's feeling. And we do know that he was very much bothered about giving to religious institutions as well. So I know that people kind of, in this day and age where we don't really think of religion in society so much, obviously compared to what they did in Anthony's day, I think you could probably be a bit cynical and say, oh, well, is he just doing that because he's following the crowd or, you know, he's showing off going oh yeah yeah i believe this but does he really and i was like but i don't think that's something that you can put on how how he how people think in 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 the past really but i think anthony himself really did mean it because he actually even adopted the pilgrim shell as his personal emblem and things like that so he really is probably you know going out of his way to show how personally he feels yeah i I just i find that really interesting about him that he was so so pious, I guess the words that I'm trying to come up with are evading me right now when it comes to that. Yeah. But but um, maybe that has something to do with him not being as excited about the marriages that Edward IV was trying to re- arrange for him. Maybe some of those went against his own ideals. Um, to a certain extent, well, we do know that um, the marriage that was being kind of negotiated between him and Margaret of Scotland, they actually did get very far along the marriage negotiations. It just so happened that England went to war with Scotland and that was the end of that. So <laughs> That put that idea to an end. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been quite amazing, though, if he had ended up being a king consort of Scotland while his sister is, you know, queen consort of England. Yeah, so um, his prospective bride was never going to be, like, queen of Queen mm. of Scotland, but you know, even still, you know, yeah. um, they but they got so far as saying that they'd have got married in Nottingham. So I don't know whether that meant she was coming to England, but close yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's definitely a good point. So let's fast forward a little bit now to the point where um, Anthony is put in charge of his nephew, the Prince of Wales, future Edward the Fifth. How does that all come about? At what point does somebody say? this is the best person for us. Do you have any idea why he was chosen? Yes. Yeah, so um, so the Prince of Wales was born whilst Elizabeth was in sanctuary, whilst 
Edward and everybody else was away in exile. So he was kind of, I don't think in a way you can look at Edward returning without the birth of Prince Edward because that again is obviously a symbol, you know, people would have seen this as a sign, as a symbol saying, okay, maybe maybe God's looking favourably on the House of York right now. And obviously that gives Edward an extra reason to come and fight back for his throne really. But obviously um, what happens obviously when Edward does obviously re regain his throne when he does come back is that now means, oh, okay, we suddenly have a Prince of Wales to, uh, you know, factor in now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we do know that when he, when he's two, it's chosen that he should go to Ludlow and kind of, you know, have his own house sort of by that point, you know, people to train him up to be the future king. I mean, it doesn't happen straight off that Anthony's chosen as kind of the governor of how of the household. It's kind of first of all starts to be a little bit of a council, and then, you know, as as obviously, you know, he's now growing out of toddler stage. It's kind <laughs> of thought right, okay, you know, we need we need something more suitable. You know, we, it's time for him to go on in in this preparation. And we do know that actually. Edward the Fourth wrote an eleven set list of rules as to how his young son should, you know, what his household should look like, how it should be governed. And actually, Anthony Woodville is the only named person in this, so it's kind of obvious that he's kind of, you know, once he decided that it does need to be more one person setting, you know, out these rules, that it should be Anthony Woodville. And one of the last um, latter rules is actually that it should be made known that people who are going to be in the household should be, you know, pious, honest, you know, that they shouldn't get up to things that they shouldn't. So I think a little bit is, I've, I can remember when I first read these rules, I thought, right, so basically Edward IV wants somebody the exact opposite of him, and which is probably why Anthony was chosen, that, you know, you know, he's the man that's, you know, he can, he's also kind of, the renaissance type man that you want in charge because it's at this point that what a future king is you know should be is starting to change from just a lot more of the, the the military side of things that you're trying to find somebody who's a bit more cultured and you know trying to be a bit more involved in the arts in literature you know and all that sort of things and actually anthony you know ticks quite a lot of those boxes so i think there's quite a few things um going off there hmm. Was there anybody else who was considered other than Anthony? This is the, not really, not in <laughs> terms of, like I said, there was in terms of, you know, when you, they have a council yeah. and obviously they, you know, there are other people involved. Um, but when it turns to, comes to deciding who's going to be the governor, i.e. the one in charge of everything with, you know, it does always seem to be Anthony. I mean, there are other people involved, like obviously then he's going to have a priest and, you know, lots of other people, like a chamberlain, you know, so it works exactly the same way as any other household. But obviously Anthony is just kind of the governor of said household. Yeah, I like that. Uh, he seems, he's like the good uncle. He's like, yeah, the good pious uncle who is educated. He likes to read, you know, he's a good jouster. What a good example for a future king. Yes. <laughs> So then, and sadly, in 1483, Edward IV suddenly passes away, and we have Anthony is sitting at a castle with his nephew, who is now king of England, but things don't quite turn out the way that they had expected, did they? No. Well, first of all, that obviously means that the now Edward, Edward V is 12 years old, which causes an issue in itself really boy kings do not really you know it creates a power vacuum in itself to be honest um you know and if you think about it even within people's living memory you had things uh henry the sixth which is the second you know that didn't end well for either of them no. um necessarily so you know this is a worrying time you know they they had had since uh edward had returned from exile about 10 years before they had had relative peace you know so there, there is absolute chaos and worry of you know is this going to you know create another eruption of the wars of the roses so 
as you can imagine, that means then that people are out to get what they can get. They are worried that they might lose positions that they had already. It's it's a, quite a worrying, troublesome time for, for everybody, really. But a lot is made of the fact that Anthony stalled the whole household at Ludlow stalled, leaving Ludlow to go to get to London for the coronation. But actually, the timing of it is, it's literally in the run-up to St George's Day. So they literally depart the day after St George's Day. And one of the rules on Edward the Fourth list was that the Prince Edward should hear divine services, particularly on holy days. And how more holy can you get than the patron saint of England? So I think there's a little bit of still trying to keep that on. And obviously, Anthony himself is, is quite religious. And he's been instructed to bring up his nephew in religious ways. So I think it's still probably the last little bit of let's keep what we promised. Um, so I think a lot of people read into that without necessarily realising the timeline of when that's happening necessarily. But even so, the whole point is they have agreed that they are to meet Richard Duke of Gloucester in Northampton and then carry on to London after that. And the other issue is, obviously, with all of this chaos going off and there has to be an armed guard, obviously, because you can't, you know, take the king to London unaided. <laughs> so there is actually a negotiation at this point as to how how many men is acceptable. And the number is reached of supposedly 2,000 2, men. And they march off towards Northampton as, as planned. And then this is when the story all gets a little bit murky of what happened, really. Um, so supposedly the story goes that there was no room at Northampton for these 2,000 men and that they go on further down the road to Stony Stratford. Now, Northampton is quite a big medieval town in terms of this time period. And Stony Stratford is basically nothing, hardly, in comparison. So it's never really made sense, <laughs> that whole um, story necessarily. But think about it, the Northampton, where they're going, Northamptonshire, this is the Woodville heartlands. This is where traditionally their land was. Mm. And Grafton Regis, their main house, actually isn't that far away from this area at all. And actually, Annette Carson, which um, I kind of agree with her, her viewpoint on this, is, well, actually, would it make sense for them, the Ludlow household, to have taken the young king to Grafton, thinking that will be the best way to keep him safe, but not necessarily re realising that that would look very suspicious to other people. Mm. Yeah, so there's so much to this story that I feel like has been hidden from us that we don't, really, because of what we're reading or seeing in film or uh, on TV series, that the the storyline is always one to be, you know, Richard the Third is the bad guy, and the Woodvilles are the good guys, right? <laughs> yes, when actually Richard knew Anthony as well, he was within part uh, part of Edward's circle himself, obviously being being Edward's brother, and they also went into exile together. And actually, just a month before Edward died. Anthony is asking Richard to intervene in a legal matter. So they are, they're not as enemies as people necessarily think. And actually when Anthony did stay behind in Northampton to meet Richard, mm. as promised, alone. And I kind of go, well, if he if he's, you know, plotting something which is supposedly what um then he's arrested for the next day, why is he meeting Richard alone? You wouldn't do that unless you utterly trusted the person that you're meeting i don't think and especially not at this time yeah exactly okay well i guess now we've reached the part where we have to talk about the end of anthony woodville and how that came apart uh came to uh fruition <laughs> yeah so as i said the next day after after richard and anthony meet anthony as well as richard gray who's one of his oldest nephews from mm -hmm. elizabeth woodville's first marriage and thomas Vaughan, who is actually the prince's um, the Prince's Chamberlain and had been pretty much almost um, since birth. All three of them were arrested supposedly on 
a Woodville um, treasonous plot. And yeah, it all goes kind of downhill from there, really. Um, so obviously the men that have, have, you know, all, you know, come to escort the king are all kind of sent away saying, you know, they're part of whatever, you know. Um, and like I said, it's all very murky because we don't know totally what's happening at this point, but this is kind of what what this thought happens. And the three men are kind of sent off to different castles owned by Richard at this point. And it's not until you get to the end, end of June that it's decided that they are are to be executed and then sent to Pontefract Castle. It's too bad. Honestly, what a terrible ending to the story, right? <laughs> yes, but I think it's totally very much about the fact that actually, in many ways, I think Richard and Anthony were very similar. They had both not really been bothered about being in the political heartlands. So I think they were very much probably listening to what other people are saying about what's been going off and this, that and the other, you know, because in that sense, they're politically naive. They've not really been there dealing with a lot of the machinations that are happening around Edward the Fourth. They're very much content with whatever their own lot is in life and whatever they're busy doing at that point. And I do think that the one person who changes the things a little bit is the Duke of Buckingham. As soon as he arrives, amazingly, Anthony and everybody is kind of arrested. So I think it's very much, like I said, a sense of people out for what they can get, stirring the pot, seeing seeing if they can improve their own lot for the future. There's so many similarities to Edward the Sixth. I can't help but notice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anytime there's a boy king, right? There's always this Exactly. Drama. Yeah. Boy king disaster. <laughs> yeah. Grasping for power. Everybody wants to be the most powerful man in the realm. Yeah. it's yeah. Well, we've only just you know, scratch the surface when it came to Anthony Woodville today. So if people are interested in learning more about him, uh, where can they find your book? Yeah, so my book is called Anthony Woodville's Sophisticate or Schema. You can find it on Amazon and pretty much most of the good book places on the internet or whatever. And I also write a history blog called Voyager of History. And I uh, not just Anthony on that, there's all sorts of different time periods, but obviously Anthony's the main thing on there. Yeah. Are you working yeah. on any other books at this time? Everybody keeps asking me this. So oh, I have no, the sorry. Idea <laughs> one, just not the tell. <laughs> uh, and then I've just, yeah, and then I've just changed my mind entirely about what it might be. So we shall see. <laughs> well, that's the difficult thing, isn't it? Once you write one book, everybody expects you to do more. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. I mean, I would like to. And like I said, I do have some ideas for what the next one could be. It's just finding the time. <laughs> That's the key, isn't it? That is always the most important part of it is finding the time to do the research and the writing to complete exactly. a book. Yeah. Well, Danny, we very much look forward to whatever work you have coming up. And in the meantime, people go check out her book. You can find it on Amazon and I'll include some links in the show notes as well. So you can check out her website too, because she's got lots of great articles on there as well. Danny, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you again for having me. And that concludes another episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you love the show and would like to show your support, consider becoming a patron over on Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Tudor's Dynasty. Over there, you'll get commercial-free episodes, early access, and some patron-exclusive content as well. If you would prefer to show your support in another way, head on over to my website, tutorsdynasty.com, and click on the shop to see some of the new merchandise that I have available. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time. The Tudors Dynasty Podcast.